Hi, thanks for joining us for the family plot. Gardening in Emmett South, I'm Chris Cooper. The grass is putting out leaves. Today we're going to talk about how, with some fertilizer, you can have a lush lawn this summer. Also, last year this time, we planted a whole bunch of shrubs in soggy ground. We're going to see how they're doing. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot, I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Booker T. Lee. Glad to be here. Mr. Booker is a UT Extension agent right here in Shelby County, and Joellen Diamond is here. Ms. Joellen is a TSU Extension agent in Tipton County, so thanks for joining us. Glad to be here, always good to be here. All yeah. right, Mr. Booker, uh -huh. you're our grass guy. It's probably that grass guy. No, it's I, that time I, of the year, I, right? I love, it's that time of the year, I love grass. I know you love yeah. grass. That's why we got you on today, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So look, just a couple of questions about lawn fertilization. Okay. All right. So the first question is, how often should I fertilize my lawn? Well, most, most lawn grass, you know, in, 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 in West Tennessee, we got two types of grass here, zoysia and, and uh, Bermuda grass, and okay. also we have fescue too, though. But zoysia and Bermuda grass is the main two that we normally have. Right. It's, it's a warm season grass. About three times a year is a good time to put, fill out those grasses. Now, sometimes uh, nitrogen fertilizer, you don't want to get nitrogen fertilized too soon. You want to make sure it starts coming out okay. to give it some nitrogen fertilizer. You don't want to give it the nitrogen fertilizer when it's going into dormant season because that's a bad time because you don't want to give it no growth. Right. And also your phosphate and potassium now, that is good to add to your lawn, but I would just add a whole lot to that because a lot of times phosphate and potassium can build up in the soil mm -hmm. and you don't want to get it too high. You know, between, uh, it can be something that between, uh, the on your test, tell you meet them or low. Right. So don't give it too much phosphate, it, it stays in the soil, but nitrogen kind of depletes itself out of the soil. Mm -hmm. You can give it more nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. But about three times a year, that, and a lot of times that's tell you all the time though, based on a soil test recommendation. Right. But right. that's one thing you might want to do that. Okay. But now, what about fertilizing the zoysia though? When should we fertilize that? Well, zoysia fertilizer, no nitrogen fertilizer until June. Until June. Okay. Until, yeah, until it starts to grow out because you don't want to give it too early. Okay. Because if you give it too early in that June, a lot of time a disease starts coming on your lawn. You don't want a whole lot of disease. You know, we know in, in, in uh, here in West Tennessee, our grass will get disease on it. <laughs> and we're going to have a lot of rain this year. We hope that it'll be okay this year. Okay. But uh, don't give it too soon, especially on nitrogen fertilizer. Okay, and mm. that's the Georgia. The Georgia, okay. yeah. All right, so when is the best time to fertilize your lawn, though? The best time to fertilize your lawn is actually when that grass begins to grow. Okay. You know, it, you know uh, Zoya grass, Bermuda grass, they grow and they start growing in the springtime, they start tying in. That's a good time to do that. And your fescue, that's a cool season grass, mm -hmm. it normally starts in, in, in the fall of the year. And that's a good time to fertilize that grass in the fall of the year when it starts, when it actually begins to grow. Now, if you start doing it too early, you can damage your grass by giving it too much fertilizer at the wrong time of the year. And we have a lot of folks that do that sometimes. Oh, wow. Just go out there and start fertilizing your lawn, and, 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 and it's the wrong time. Right. If that grass start putting out early, and then before, before, and they have another cold spell, it could damage that grass, okay. especially, especially with the warm season grass. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good note right there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, we talked to them about, we're talking about fertilizer. What's in the fertilizer bag, though? Now, the people to go buy that fertilizer bag, you need to know what you're putting down right. in, on the in bag of fertilizer. You really, have, you have a complete fertilizer, and then you have an incomplete. Okay. When I say complete fertilizer bag, you got all three major nutrients in there, your, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and potassium. Okay. Incomplete fertilizer, you might have just one of those numbers you be missing. You might have nitrogen and phosphorus. No potassium in that bag. It all depends on what you want to do to your lawn. We know Bermuda grass, on, the zoysia only, as a nitrogen only do one thing mm -hmm. for your lawn. It turn it green, and make it grow. <laughs> and, uh, right. and you want to get that to it, that, that's what's in the bag of fertilizer. You know, if I want my grass to grow real pretty and green during the growing season, I give it more nitrogen fertilizer. Right. But then start in the fall of the year when it start going dormant, hold back on your nitrogen fertilizer and give it some phosphate potassium. Okay. It protecting those root system from diseases and also making a stronger root system when it's going into the winter months. So do what you do. Then you then then fescue lung. And you want to nitrogen start in the fall of the year with that, right. with, with the nitrogen fertilizer in there. But in a bag of fertilizer, you have nitrogen, phosphate, and metallic, and those the main three elements gonna be in a bag of fertilizer. And they might, like I said, one might, might be missing, might have nitrogen and no phosphate. Mm -hmm. Might have phosphate and potassium and no nitrogen. It's all depending on what come back with your soil test. Okay, mm -hmm. all based on the soil Maybe on the soil test. That's right. All right, so how do I select the right fertilizer for my lawn, though? 
when, 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 when you do your soil test and they come back to you, they'll tell you what to put down on there. Okay. You know, they said nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, how much, how much to put down. And when you start putting that fertilizer down on there, you want to make sure you get a good coverage on that, on that lawn. You want to go and do it in two directions. Mm. If you said put 20 pounds down on your lawn, you want to go 10 in one direction and 10 in the other direction. You want to get a full coverage of that lawn. Right. If not, you can, you, you can miss spot, and you can tell when you miss spot in your lawn, <laughs> you might have light green, mm -hmm. a dark green in there and stuff in there. But you want to go different direction. Okay. And, and, and get all that fertilizer down in there. Okay. Mm. Let's mention this though. When people are putting out the fertilizer, let's make sure <laughs> that, you know, if they get it on the sidewalk or the driveway or something like that, that they actually sweep it, you know, up and put it back in the lawn though. It's good because a lot of times, you, you see that a lot of times, mm -hmm. people use these, these spread it, put it out over there, and you'll see a lot of fertilizer mm -hmm. on your driveway. And that's not doing any good because what they have when it rains, they get that's down right. to in, 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 in the sewage and water line or whatever, that's not good for them. Put it back in, the, like, like you said, put it back in, get your broom or something, sweep it up, or put it back into the, into the lawn. That's where right. it needed, where it needed. That's right. You, you, want it on, you want it on the grass, That's right. not on the sidewalk. Right. Mm -hmm. And not in our storm water. <laughs> not storm you know, water. Drainage systems, right? Right. Because mm -hmm. there's fish at the end of that. Mm -hmm. All right. So we talked a little bit about the soil test. So why should I have my soil tested, right? Because we yeah. always mention soil tests. A lot of times people, they start adding stuff to right. the lawn. They don't, know what, they don't know what's in it. They don't know what they're doing to it. And I tell you, you wouldn't add you wouldn't add oil to your car without checking it. And that's the same thing by doing a soil test. You don't want to add fertilizer thing to your soil without testing it, because you, like I said, phosphorus and potassium can build up. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get it too high in there. And on your soil test, it'll come back and tell you in there. Then another thing, you trying to look at the soil pH. The pH is one of the most important things mm -hmm. in your soil test. If the pH is off, the nitrogen your phosphorus and your potassium not going to be used by the plant. Mm -hmm. It just don't stay into the soil. For most lawn grass, we have a moody grass, Georgia grass, and your fescue lawn. They require a soil pH between 6.0 and 6.5. Okay. So then, and on your soil test, when it come back, it'll tell you that. Now, if it's too low, they tell you add lime to it. If it's too if it's too high, they tell you add some elemental sulfur to your soil to bring it down. But I said, the main thing is your soil pH. Nitrogen, they, they hardly get a reading on your nitrogen too often. Right. Because nitrogen don't stay in the soil too long. That's right. It's come in and go away. But check very closely when they give you, when they tell you on your soil, on your pot, on your phosphorus and potassium. Because that can build up in the soil. Mm -hmm. But on that soil to report, if you don't need any, that's why you might need an incomplete fertilizer. You might just right. need to add nitrogen to your fertilizer and no phosphorus and potassium. It might come back real low very low phosphorus potassium. But then on your nitrogen, it, it might be a lot of nitrogen. Then it might tell you no nitrogen fertilizer sometimes, phosphorus potassium. So you might have an incomplete, a complete fertilizer. That's why I say on a bag of fertilizer, you have a complete bag of fertilizer or incomplete. From the grass guru himself. <laughs> Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Mr. Booger. We appreciate that. I enjoy it. It's always good. All, be right. Sure. All right. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Joel, let's take a look at our plantings from last year. Yeah, last year at this time, it was really hot. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Uh, I think the season was a little early last mm -hmm. year. All of these trees were leafed out. I do remember that. And it was hot when we were planting. This year, not the same. It's a lot cooler than it was. And, and in fact, the, the trees aren't even finished leafing out. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's a little late in spring, but and everything's just showing a little bit behind. But we're going to go ahead and see how things are going. Okay, yeah, let's check it out. Now, you notice there's a lot of spots on there, but the new foliage mm -hmm. is what I look at, and it looks good. Yeah. In fact, it's actually blooming. It's a nice flower. Okay. 
uh, and then the, the, the leaves will, that are damaged will probably fall off and the new leaves will come on. Uh, but we'll keep watching it, of course. Okay. Yeah, this is not a bad sign because it's no. the older leaves. Older. You know, as, as long as the new foliage is fine, then we're good. It'll be fine. Okay. Next we yeah. have our Yopon hollies yeah. here. And you notice they aren't as tight because they've grown. That's right. <laughs> so they they're, they're seem to be very happy in this environment. Mm -hmm. So it's working out pretty good for them, huh? For the it most is. Part. Okay. It is. New nice growth. new foliage on them. So I think they're going to be fine. And then the next of our spireas. Uh -huh. Wow. They've grown quite a bit yeah, too. They're filled out. Really filled out. They must be happy here. But I don't know if you notice it, but there's aphids covering all the oh, new yeah. growth because aphids love new growth. But as you can see, there's the predators here too. That's right. So we would not spray these because we've got beneficials that are taking care of the aphids so we don't have to spray. Good, yeah. And those are the larvae of a lady beetle. Lady right? beetles. And of course they love to eat aphids. They so sure do. it's good do. to see them. It's good to see them. Very good. Good sign. Okay. So overall, what do you think about the plant itself though? I think it's doing great. It's doing good. Okay. And you notice that the flower buds are starting to that. form okay. on them too. I see that. So, everything looks good. Okay. And, well, let's look at the uh, Ogon Sweet Flag. Okay. And it's doing fairly well. So it's a little worse for wear because, you know, we had a really cold winter. <laughs> we did. So, we did. It's, it's reflecting that. It looked tattered. Yeah. It's, it's blooming too. Right. These blooms. So, it's quite healthy and growing. Okay. And it will look better as the season progresses. So we don't have to, you know, come in don't, and trim anything off or cut um, anything back? I guess you could if you want to, but okay. you really, from a distance, you can't notice okay. it. So sure. I usually don't mess with things. Mother Nature, let them come out and do what they want to do and, and cover all of that. Okay. They look really nice. And they've gotten bigger. Uh, some of them not as big as others, right. but, you know, overall, they're doing very well. Okay. And then we have our daylilies, Stella de Oro daylilies. Boy, have they gotten big since <laughs> we planted good. them. They really look good, and they're starting to bloom also. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very nice. Nice green leaves. Very right. lush. Mm -hmm. uh, then we've got our cannas that we transplanted that were here in one clump. I remember. We transplanted <laughs> them into three clumps, and they have grown nicely yes. and coming out very well. So that's very encouraging. That transplanting went well. And lastly, we have our plumbago. Uh, some of them are starting to come out and do very well. Others are kind of behind. We don't see any life coming out of them yet, mm. but it's early. Right, so no so concern. No right? concern okay. for now because, you know, even the trees aren't finished being leafed this out. So and we just haven't had the warm weather like we had last year. This is right, yeah, it's definitely been wet and cool. Wet and cool, which right. is very unusual for this part sure of the country. Is. Yeah. Okay. So overall, what do you think about the plantings? I'm very pleased. As, as wet well. as this bed was when we started and still is, yes. I think everything has done very, very well. We picked wisely and picked some good yeah. plants that could stand this kind of environment. Yeah, well, we followed your lead, so we thank you for the plant selection. Right? <laughs> You're welcome. Because right, this is definitely soggy ground, right? Soggy, very soggy. We do have some weeds growing up, and they look like seedlings from you know trees and things like that. So what do you think the best way is to get rid of those? Well, it could be easy to pull them up because, you know, there's a large, deep layer of mulch here, so they're not rooted in the ground very much. This is, this is true. So far. Okay. So you can do that. Or, you know, there's some people that would put glyphosate on a wick and uh -huh. just touch them, and that would get that's, rid of them that's also. Another so there's, there's just different ways to do that mechanically or just touch them with uh, a wick of uh, some glyphosate. Okay, I would agree with that. And again, soggy ground's been moist. I mean, it easily easy can come to up. pull up. Right, yeah. easy to come up there. And there's not very many of them so far. So. Not that many. Again, just little seedlings and little annual winter weeds that I see. Mm -hmm. So it should be fine. It'll be fine. All right. So thanks, Joel. We appreciate that. All right. No problem. All right. We're going to spend a little time talking about BT now, Bacillus thuringiensis. 
again, BT is a lot easier to remember. Uh, this product is one of the greatest insecticides out there on the market. It uh, has been around for a lot of years, and the reason that it is so good is that it targets a, one specific type of insect. It only kills caterpillars, uh, insects in the insect order Lepidoptera. And, uh, it is a stomach poison. It uh, works by the insect actually has to ingest some of the BT and it uh, will cause the insect to develop a really, really bad stomach ache and die. Um, but you will actually see some damage on the plants uh, and you have to see a little bit of damage for this material to work. But it does not kill any of the beneficial insects. It, it is not uh, adversely affect humans. I want to talk a little bit about uh, different formulations. Bacillus thuringiensis, it comes uh, in a liquid formulation, a wettable powder formulation, and as a dust. With both of these formulations, it is important to get adequate coverage or good coverage on the plant. Uh, the dust uh, formulation is uh, uh, a little harder to get very good control or very good coverage because it's a little bit harder to, uh, to uh, uh, get your dust on the underside of the leaf utilizing a dust. Uh, there are applicators that uh, you can actually force air through and it will blow the dust out and do a pretty good job, but most of the dust applicators are, end up being something like this. This is a homemade one. Uh, we've got some holes in the top and it makes a pretty decent applicator. And I'm just going to start applying a little bit of this dust here. You can see uh, we got a little of the dipel coming out. Sometimes you have to shake it up a little bit. Uh, might need to put another hole or two in there. Uh, see that's fogging up a little bit. But it's important that you get enough of this material on the leaves to uh, that it's there when that caterpillar ingests some of that bacteria. Uh, when that happens, in a couple of days, the caterpillar will stop feeding, and in then just a little bit more time, it will die. And this would work a little bit better with a few extra holes in the top, and we'll do that before we use it again. Uh, now I want to show a, another product which is sometimes confused with dust. It's a wettable powder formulation. Remember, wettable means that you mix it with water. Uh, you don't want to use the dust mixed with water. The concentration uh, of the dust is a lot less than the concentration of a wettable powder formulation. So the wettable powder, in this case, we have already mixed up, and, and with a wettable powder, sometimes they are harder to stay in suspension than some of the ECs or emulsifiable concentrates. But uh, so when you have a, this one is, is in suspension really good now, and uh, so you keep it shook up, and uh, as I mentioned with the dust, it's very important to get uh, good spray coverage, uh, and you want the upper and lower side of the leaves covered. And it's a little hard to do. You have to kind of get on the inside of the plant and shoot out. And most of the recommendations when you're applying any pesticides is sprayed at the point of runoff. And you can see that's happened right there. I don't need to put any more material on that leaf right there because it is already running off. Well, I hope this uh, makes you uh, better understand how to properly use Bacillus thuringiensis Bt. A pretty long start with the lawnmower blade. To have a pretty nice cut, you need to have a sharp lawnmower blade. I have visited a lot of lawn where the blade, the grass looked kind of cut, jagged like, because the lawnmower blade wasn't sharp. You need to sharpen that blade at least twice during the growing season. Take it off, to, take it off the lawnmower, take it to your hardware store and get it sharp. And one of the things you need to make sure you do now, when you get that lawnmower blade sharp, and make sure that you know how to go back on there. So put you a little small little mark on that lawnmower blade for you to know how that blade came off that lawnmower. Another thing you need to do, make sure you unsplug the, unsplug the spark plug when you're working on the, lawnmower, on, the, on the lawnmower because you don't want to have no accident. Twice during the growing season, had that blade sharp. All right, here's our Q&A segment. So we can use up in there, help us out, all right? I'm glad to. All right, here's our first viewer email. 
I purchased a peach tree. I have not planted it yet because the weather is too cold. Are withered peach leaves toxic? I want to know that it is safe to plant in my backyard about eight feet from my garden. And this is from Miss Leatris. So she wants to know are the withered peach leaves toxic? Because of course she has a garden, Joel. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think? Well, come to find out, yes, peach tree le leaves are toxic. They do contain some cyanide. Mm -hmm and you're not supposed to let your pets eat them. Right, no dogs, don't let you your can. cats, you know, uh, horses. Horses, yeah. cows, yeah. rabbits, yeah. no. Uh, but now eight feet from her garden, is that, I'm more, I'm more concerned if it's gonna shade her garden. Oh, interesting, okay. And it, but it depends on what kind of garden she has too. <laughs> right. yeah, so, right. um, but when the leaves drop off the peach tree, I would tend to want to collect them because of all the disease problems that are prone to peaches and collect them and put them either in its own place in the compost pile or just destroy them. Mm -hmm. But because I wouldn't just leave peach leaves lying around in any fruit trees. Right, right. right. You know, they, there's too much overwintering of disease problems that's with right. them. That's right. Yeah, I would definitely practice good sanitation. Yeah, that's, one good thing. That no, that's, that's, that's good though, no, like the eight feet from the vegetable garden. Yeah, get those leaves from around that tree all the time. Just pick those up in there, and I, I think it should be okay and everything. As long as you get them up and everything around the tree, and if you don't have no big rain and then wash them down, they should be okay. But okay. put them in a compost pile, let them ride in the cave for a while, and build up your heat. They should be okay, you think? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, we're not saying there's going to be a problem in her garden per se. No. Right? no. Right. It's so no, far from it to eight feet. Yeah, eight feet. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right, Miss Lee. I just hope that helps you out there. All right. Here's our next for your email. Can I use landscape material to protect my garden plants from frost? And this is from Dorothy in Hayti, Missouri. <laughs> All right, so using landscape material, right? Because again, yes. we've had frost, you know, in this area, and definitely they had it in Missouri. So what can yes. you use? Well, uh, yes, she could use landscape okay. material. In fact, I was in Missouri recently, oh. and at the nurseries there, they use. Uh, different types of gravel to heal in their trees at the nurseries to keep them standing up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, you can. In landscape fabric, anything that to cover them to protect them from the cold is a good thing. Right. Um, I use buckets occasionally. I mean, I don't usually have a whole garden full of stuff, and I have used some landscape fabric mm -hmm. when I didn't have enough buckets to go over everything, and I said, well, you know, here, I'll just put a little landscape fabric over mm -hmm. the top of you, and that should <laughs> hold. Um, but you, one thing you've got to remember is you've got to uncover it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and that's the important part. I mean, the next day it might it be sunny. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you've put like cut um, any kind of gallon containers, you know, milk cartons, soda containers, and you put it over the top to save them that night, well, if it's sunny the next day, you're going to get them, you're going to have a create a greenhouse and you're going to have right. to get that off of there. So actually, darker materials to keep the sun out would probably be a better idea if you can't, you know, if you have to go leave early from work, you know, to work and you can't get back in time to be able to uncover them. Something that is not clear to create that greenhouse effect would probably be better okay. to put on them, okay. to protect them. Another thing, you want to make sure you're not laying directly on the plant. Right. You want to get, get, you, you get to some uh, stakes or something Good kind point. of around there for the after they can get through it, but not frost get on there. But you don't want to get too hot to land directly on your plant. Like Joellen said, mm -hmm. early that morning you, you need to take it off. It, it, right. it can heat up so fast by there. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and it needs down. to come all the way down to the ground as well. Mm -hmm. To the ground. Because right. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. the heat, of course, is radiating from the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, any landscape material. And I know people that use, uh, you know, for their container plants, pine straw. You just kind of cover pine it up straw? with pine straw. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. that works as well. All right. So thank you, Dorothy, for that question. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I moved an elephant ear in the back of my truck and the wind ripped the leaves off. What should I do to save it? And this is from Jesus via YouTube. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> how do we, how do yeah. we save that? What well, do you, think? you know, the, uh, the tuber that, that all the leaves are coming from, you know, if, the, if it's actively growing, it's got a lot of energy in it. So I'm sure that they will just leaf back out again. I would cut off the tattered ones, but if there's, you know, and they're the broken ones, but there, there might be one that's still, you know, okay, and then you leave that one, and it'll help put more energy down in the, in the tuber, and then it will come back out and be just fine, because they're pretty strong. I would Hardy. do it as well. 
Mm. Sure will. I, agree, I agree with Joe. That's one thing to do. And they, they'll come back, uh, the Elephant League. They got those big old wide leaves oh, on there. Leaves. <laughs> then, then, Beautiful then, leaves. Beautiful leaves. Yeah, they, they, they'll come mm-hmm. back on there. Right. Yes, definitely. Like yeah. I said, anyone that's already damaged, you might want to cut that off there, too. Because mm, the wind can damage them plants real, real, real. Right. real. Especially in your back, back of your, your truck. truck. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, but uh, yeah, the carbohydrates there, you know, inside, <laughs> yeah. you know, that tuber, it, it'll, it'll push, push you right back out. Though. Yeah, it will. Mm. All right, so be careful when you drive it around with plant material in the back of your truck. In the back of your truck, yeah. All right, thanks for the question. All right, so Mr. Booker, Mr. Joella, we're out of time. It was fun. Enjoy. Very good. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you would like to see the video of Joel and planting the shrubs we checked up on, or get more information about fertilizing your lawn, go to familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, you can also ask us your gardening questions. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots, Garning in the Mid-South. Peace out.